Hi, I'm Rodney A. Brooks. Welcome to RodneyABrooks.com. Today we're talking with Elizabeth White, author of 55 Unemployed and Faking Normal. We're going to talk about her book, um, what motivated her to write it, and, and the kind of motivational things that she is doing now. So let's start with the, with the book. Um, that, that's, that was such a fascinating story to me. Um, where you were and how you ended up uh, 55 and unemployed. So let's give it a, a recap. So I'm someone who was doing really well until I wasn't. Uh, I have all the props and credentials, Harvard MBA, uh, master's degree from Johns Hopkins, I've worked at the World Bank, it's kind of all the stuff. So during the Great Recession, so 2008-9, I lost two very good consultancies that took me to zero. Was not worried, was in my mid-50s then. I'm 68 now. And not worried because I had that background. And what I found is that my phone stopped ringing. And weeks turned into months. And speaking with women friends, because women talk to each other, that I was not the only one. A very good friend of mine was an Emmy Award winning producer. Still, same story, couldn't find work and on and on. And at a moment of despair, sitting on my grandson's bed, I wrote an essay describing what it's like to land here. What does it feel like when you are looking in at a world that's no longer your world? And you don't know if you'll ever get that. The essay made its way onto the PBS Facebook page. And in a day and a half, 11,000 people had responded. And it was all me too, my husband, my sister, myself. Why aren't we having this conversation? What happens when they comment is they do two or three sentences. They will find your email address, and they will write you. And what they wrote me it would be a page and a half single space. And so I started to have all these stories of people who were in their 50s and 60s who had been pushed out of the workforce. So I had the background to look at the data, and that's when I knew this was not a personal Elizabeth story and her group of friends. This was a national crisis, this retail, this. Uh, uh, retirement income uh, crisis was, was one that many, many people were facing. And what I say to people is, even if you're not going through it, right now, if you're in your 50s and you think about your friendship circle, all of us know somebody who used to be okay and now they're not okay. And I'm not talking about people who've been struggling all their lives and are having a rough go of it in old age. I'm talking about people who were good, and now they're not good. Now, so that led to the book. Okay, so let's talk about the faking normal part of it, because because for your friends you were hanging out with, you didn't let on that you were that you were you know in this financial situation. Now I've gotten very good at the sign. So you'll notice that person who used to always order a glass of Chardonnay is now ordering mineral water with lime. I've sat in SUVs where they pull up to the gas station and they're putting $7 in their car. I see people who normally are on point long between haircuts, long between getting their hair done. You see people who constantly decline invitations or they don't want you to come to their house because they're embarrassed that the carpet needs cleaning and it's not, you know, hasn't been maintained or their repairs, plumbing in the bathroom's not working, etc. So the faking normal, we live in a culture where there's a lot of shame associated with landing here, even though there are millions of people who have landed here. And that shame makes us then present 
like we're okay when we're not okay. That was what the fake new normal was. Okay, so so okay, so you wrote the book, and uh, and uh, things started to turn around after you wrote the book. So I wrote first the essay, and when the story started to come in by email, um, I also started to meet people. Someone would say, "I live in D.C. I'm going to be in D.C. Do you want a coffee?" And I would meet them for coffee. Or you should meet my friend so-and-so, who they're in that situation. So at some point, I had enough stories to do my first self-published book, which was 55, Unemployed and Faking Normal. And then I did, for Simon & Schuster, 55, Underemployed and Faking Normal. And I, I'm not going to say there was sort of a dramatic turnaround. What there was, was the sort of slow build. So I started to get invited to speak. Um, one of the things that really helped me is that fairly soon after my book, I was on the PBS News Hour. Uh -huh. And they did not one episode, not two, but three profiles of me over a period of time. So that gave me a national platform. I then did a TEDx talk that was elevated to the main TED stage that now has over 2 million views. So between those two things and starting to speak various places, that started to give me um, kind of a national platform to advocate on behalf of millions of older adults who have landed here. And I like to say to people, this is not a pesky little boomer problem. Gen Xers don't have pensions either. Millennials are not going to have pensions. They too are looking at escalating cost and housing and health care. So this is a problem that boomers, we're just the, faith, the first up this hill facing this challenge. Okay, so, so you're basically doing motivational speaking now, correct? Or is that, tell, yeah, tell me what you're doing now. So, this led to assignments to write. It led to opportunities to speak. And then most recently, I uh, was invited to join a startup incubator. One of the things I say to people is, um, it's important if you're older to have friends of every age. Because what I find is that most of my assignments come from people who are in their 40s and early 50s. Because right. they're still in the game. They still know who the rising stars are. They know where the money is. They know opportunities that are kind of on the horizon that in my circle, they may not know. So um, a friend of mine in her, I think she's probably in her mid-40s, told me about a program that was supporting entrepreneurs. I've been an entrepreneur before. I had a chain of stores. I've raised money. I sold widgets. I know what a straight vertical lift that is. She said, no, but they'll really help you if you join um, this program. So I throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall. and. In January, I sort of made it from the second to the third, and then the third to the fourth interview. And once they told me I had made it to the third, I started to really pay attention, because now you know you're really in the running. And I learned that I got it. And I say to people, I feel a little bit like Grandma Moses in there. <laughs> Because I'm 68, the next person closest in age to me is probably 43. There are five of us. And then the other ones are all in their 30s. So I am in this environment with people much younger than myself. I'm having a blast. The thing I love is, up until now, I've been focused on the problem. And now I have an opportunity to look at one of the solutions. What people say to me is housing is the challenge. If I have my housing, 
They say, I can extreme coupon it the rest of the way. So my project is looking at affordable co-living models for older adults aging alone. And because um, one of the things, so many of us are going to have to downsize. And right now, downsizing looks mainly like loss and deprivation. But what if it didn't have to look like that? What if you could, on a smaller footprint, live in something that is beautiful, that supports wellness, that is, has some futuristic aspects to it, has some um, enhanced by technology. So I am working with Cooper Carey in Atlanta, a big architectural firm, to design something that would go into a multifamily building for older adults who are aging alone and want to live together. Because one of the things that's going to be necessary is we're going to have to pool resources. A lot of us, just with Social Security or a little bit of savings, are not going to have enough mm -hmm. to live. If, you, if, you, if you're 60 in reasonably good health, you have a more than 50% chance of living into your 90s. That means you're going to need housing for decades, not years. This isn't like 1935 when Social Security was enacted and life expectancy was 62. You basically lived a few years and then you were dead. Now, at 62, you could have another 30 years that you have to support yourself. And we're not going to be able to do that if everybody needs their own snowmobile, their own vacuum cleaner, their own car. We're just not going to be able to do it. So I am interested in and collaborating with people who have another model of what the future could look like. So you completely reinvented yourself. So let's go back to the unemployed part. Okay, was there a point where you thought you had reached complete bottom? And I know, if I remember, you owned your condo, and that was one of the things that helped you through that period when you were unemployed. So my mother, Dorothy White, was not going to let Elizabeth White lose her condo. That was not going to happen. So, uh, and I bought, I've lived where I lived 36 years. So where I live now was not, the neighborhood has shifted dramatically. So that is an, uh, an important asset that is an anchoring um, uh, asset for me. And then what I learned through this process is how do I live the way I want to live on much, much less? So there is this whole process of what I call smalling up. So that means, and it can mean different things for different people. So I have a friend. He plays the flute. He run, his cars are what we would call hoopties. Okay, he is not spending money on a car, but he will spend $14,000 on a flute. Because <laughs> the flute is what grounds him and gives him his joy. I have another friend, church for her is her garden, working in her garden on the weekend. She has you know, tools I haven't even seen, you wouldn't know what they were, but it's all for her garden. There are a couple I know, they're foodies, they buy one entree, they split it, and then each gets a glass of wine. So kind of figuring out what is it that you love and how can you do that in a more affordable way. It is also meant at times for me what I call getting off my throat. I, I tell a story of a friend of mine who um, she t mentioned to me she had some organizing work she wanted me to do with her. And I'm thinking President Obama organizing in the community. She said, no, organizing somebody's closet. And I said, I don't want to do that. She said, Elizabeth, get off your throne. This is money. You need to do it. So all of these things were in the period of time where I'm, take, I'm doing editing and you know all kinds of little odd uh, assignments 
a uh, friend of mine who had Airbnb, needed someone to help her clean up after, I mean, just the range of it, taking the Greyhound bus to New York. I'm someone who's flown Concord <laughs> before. So just getting off the throne, thinking in terms of what I call strategy, not failure. So strategy, not failure means that you have to do what you need to do till you get to the next step. So that, that means if I need to take the Greyhound bus so I don't miss a meeting in New York, I'm taking the Greyhound bus. So kind of going through all of that. Okay, so let's talk about, okay, so basically based on your experience from where you were at the very bottom to where you are now, what kind of advice do you have for people who find themselves, you know, senior aging and um, who really want to work and end up uh, getting laid off because a lot of that is still going on. Um, and, uh, um, and basically despondent because they can't find a job because, because there's so much age discrimination. So there are different things. One thing that the pandemic has done that I think is a huge benefit for older people Four years ago, if you said to somebody you wanted to work remotely, oh, <laughs> that was not happening, and why did you bring it up? Now it's very common. Everybody I know who's gotten a job recently, there's a remote option to it. So they're in two days a week, three days a week, there's a remote option. This is great for older adults. So one, so I, I go, uh, first thing I would say is, recognizing that you're not alone because the shame aspect has us circling the drain in terms of the negative tapes that you know we're just running in our head that negative tape if you're not talking to somebody in my book i i invite people to create what i call resilient circles what helped me as i was going through this was having a few people that I could talk to. I mean, really tell the truth to. Tell them that my phone was about to be cut off. Tell them that I needed to get food stamps, etc. So, because if you don't have that, when you do finally get an opportunity to be in an interview, you leak. You leak your frustration. You leak your stress. And the person who's talking to you they may not know like exactly what's going on. They just know that energy they don't want in their workplace or on their project. So you need to few friends who are going through this, and they don't have to be the closest friends. I've had people put the essay that I wrote on um, LinkedIn and have some people who then want to join. You don't have to meet in people's homes. You can meet in the library to just start having the conversations. And in my book, I lead people through some of the questions that we consider. So one is not alone. Two is getting your head straight for this period that you're going through. Three is this getting off your throne. So that means the things that you might not have normally considered, you're going to have to consider through this period. I think in terms of a casserole of work. So it, you may not find that nine to five W-2 long bread job that you used to have. You may be bundling different things together. And it can be from uh, you know, teaching at a community college, it could be you know, a little bit of Lyft driving, it could be some Airbnb stuff. I have friends who are doing all of that and kind of putting it together. It is thinking strategy, not failure. So that means if you need to get food stamps as a way to help you make it to the next place, get them. There are like a third of the people right now who are eligible, older adults, don't get them. First time I got SNAP, they now call it, I drove all the way to the other side of town because I didn't want to go to my Harris Teeter where I normally go. When I got there, the young woman who was at the, uh, who was the cashier didn't pay me any attention, attention at all. It doesn't matter, they're not paying attention. But if you need to 
get SNAP. Don't let shame prevent you from getting it if that's the piece that's going to get you to the next place. If you have to move in for three months with your crazy sister and sleep in her basement <laughs> and you're going to hear every day all, you know, everything, you need to do what you need to do to go the next round. I think that it's also not unrealistic to have like a bigger dream for yourself. This path I'm on was not the one I had imagined. I did not choose it, but I love having, you know, kind of what I'm doing now. It just sort of unfolded. As we live longer, children who are five now, uh, a good chance the five-year-olds in our country are going to live to 100. So that means that you're going to have more than one career. That means that when you graduate from college at 21, you're not done learning. That education is not going to take you the next 80 years. So there's a whole mindset shift that we need to have in terms of continuing to educate ourselves. So uh, when I joined this incubator, the younger people just were better at the technology. They're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I needed to be proficient, but I don't need to be as good as they are. So I, hi I have money in this program. I hired somebody. She's really good. So I will, I'm working on a deck now. I do the basic deck, give it to her, and she will much faster. I can do a deck, but she can do it much faster. So um, being willing to change, having a mindset of curiosity, a lot of us say we're open, we're not. A lot of us say we're curious, we're not. And all of those things together, um, plus realizing that it may make sense to pool resources with other people. I think this is easier in some ways for women because we're already connected, already uh, you know, getting together, already being very candid with each other, is what is going to help us get from where we are to where we are going, which is going to be decades, not a few years. Okay. And, and I, I want to say this is not only an individual issue. This is a systemic issue. Mm -hmm. In this country, we like the story that goes kind of like this. Somebody was walking, we hear it, they walked 10 miles to work, back, they had a minimum wage job, the workers get together, buy them some kind of hoop and we're all crying. The question is, why is he having to walk that far? Why is he only getting minimum wage? Why did they have, okay, so in the absence of comprehensive policy to address the retirement income crisis, then we are left having to scramble around and do this ourselves. But the truth is, every private sector company needs to have a plus 50 strategy. And, and it makes sense. When you think about how much money the plus 50 market segment is spending, mm -hmm. it's like, what is it, eight, almost eight and a half trillion dollars a year. We buy a third of the cars, a third of the trucks. We're buying a lot of the apparel. And somebody said to me, I don't have to switch my car out every five years. I don't have to go on vacation. I don't have to buy clothes. If I'm not working, that's where I am. And I'm a lot of your market. And so, um, and then we're a big part of the workforce already. So we are, it's like we're caught in a time warp of the 1950s, when in fact, many people are living longer and fitter lives. Many people need to work. 
many people are going to laugh. So these are not just your individual. I'm talking about individual things because there's no comprehensive policy. So here's something that I learned fairly recently that was shocking to me. I learned that um, our health outcome, that genetics accounts for only about 15% of it. Okay, so meaning that the rest of it is your, all your, your stressors, how we're eating, exercise, etc. So your 20s and 30s are right now determining what your 60s and 70s are going to be like. So that means that, because I think there's a, a, a tendency for us to think, oh, that what happens now has nothing to do with that. Everything that is happening now has to do with that. So I think it is important to begin saving now. I think it is important now to begin thinking of um, if I'm smoking, if I'm not getting enough rest, if I'm doing this, that, and the other that's harming me now, though it doesn't really show because I'm young, it is actually going to be one of the determinants of what your old age will look like. And I didn't know that. You know, you sort of, I, I knew that I thought genetics was more of a, a factor in how we age. And it's actually much less than what I thought. So I think the um, looking ahead, and at your age, it, you don't even have to, you have the benefit of compounding your money growing because you're young enough. You don't have to put like a lot aside. It is more consistency and, um, you know, not resisting situations where you have to go into it and take it all out. Mm -hmm. Okay, and my final question is, is there special advice that you have for black women? A statistic I saw, I read, and this is just, whoa, uh, black educated women, our median wealth at 60 is $11,000. Let that number sink in. And this had, you know, we are often single. Um, though, you know, we could have been divorced or widowed or any sort of set of circumstances. We're often by ourselves. But we're taking care of a lot of people. A lot of people are relying on us. And we are uh, experiencing wage disparity. The gap, if black women made what white men made, we'd have a million dollars more over a 40-year period. Now think of that, a million, almost a million dollars more. That's a house, that's college tuition, that's daycare, that's rent, et cetera. So we are facing the cumulative effect of gender bias and race discrimination. So, so we are, and all of that shows up as less savings, lower pensions, reduced social security, et cetera. So that's where we're starting. I think it will be everything that I'm saying it's 10 times for us. So we definitely need to start thinking about how do we live together? How do we pull resources together? We definitely have to think about um, how do we downsize, not in a way that's lost in deprivation, but how can we do it in a way that supports wellness? And um, allows us to save a little more, allows us to um, uh, not be under the stress that we are under when we're trying to do everything ourselves. So the, the, it's the same advice with turbocharge. 
in there because we're starting at a place because of the racism we face and the gender bias we face that puts us further behind to begin with. Great. We're talking with author Elizabeth White. Is there, are there any final thoughts or anything uh, you want to share with our, um, <laughs> with our listeners? I am totally redoing my website and I am, as I am thinking about this co-living model, I'm not the, the sage on the stage. I am going to be inviting you to co-create with me. I'm going to want you to see renderings. I'm going to want your feedback. And I'm going to want to come back and talk to Rodney as I get further along. Uh, I will know, I haven't decided yet where this is going to be. You know, I'm sort of partial to D.C. D.C. is expensive, so we're looking at uh, a lot of places. It's a journey I want you to come with me on as I am learning, um, where there will be opportunities to sign up for this. Kind of, that's the process that I'm in now. And I don't want to do it by myself. Hey, Elizabeth White, tell us how, tell us how we can get your book. Um, two ways, and I always say the library. One of the reasons I did a Simon & Schuster book is that when I self-published, I couldn't get my book in libraries because a lot of libraries don't like to carry independent books. I know that there are some of you who can't afford to go on Amazon or go to an independent bookstore and get the book. So you can get it in the library. If they don't have it, they can order it for you. But all the other, you can get it in independent bookstores. You can definitely get it on Amazon. Good. Well, thank you so much for coming in and talk to us. Appreciate no, thank it. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> <laughs>